can cover them just myself. So I'm just going to put in a little timer of one hour 10 so that I know when to start wrapping up to answer questions. And um, okay. So I hope you're all here and um, welcome to the first of two days. I'm going to be focusing on econometrics um, and the markets. On Thursday, I'll be looking at derivatives and obviously in the implied measure, more on options and variants and so forth. The um, first section here um, is to provide you with just an overview of what we're dealing with. And I do find my weekly updates from Great South Gate, Gate Great South Gate, that's GSG Digital Asset Management, invaluable. Um, they cover some of the um, important developments. They also send an update of the top um, nine uh, in terms of market cap. These coins, um, Bitcoin, Ether is the coin. Ethereum is actually the blockchain that it's built on. But anyway, Binance coin, Polkadot. Again, Polkadot is the blockchain. Dot is the coin. Cardano, um, Ripple. I don't know why they don't spell that out, which isn't exactly, a, it's not a um, built on a public blockchain. It is a cryptocurrency, but it's, it's slightly different. We can explain that in more detail later. Uniswap, Litecoin and Chainlink. Um, these two new ones, Uniswap and Chainlink, are both very important parts of the um, decentralized finance boom that's been happening since last year. Um, now the price of Bitcoin is in a, a third bubble. Um, we'll talk through the reasons for that in brief. Um, I haven't made slides about it, but uh, we can discuss them. Um, nearly 20% return in seven days. Um, and the whole uh, universe of crypto is being driven by the price of Bitcoin. Um, whereas Bitcoin has no intrinsic value, um, gold has a bit, but gold's value as a gold's um, utility as a store of value, as a sort of safe haven, is the main use of gold. And some people call Bitcoin digital gold for that reason. Um, these other coins actually have utility, they're, they're actually used for things, they're more like commodities, really. Um, you can see that some of them have huge volatility. A lot of this is upside rather than downside volatility. But, you know, 80% volatility for Bitcoin is on the low side, you know, um, the newer the coin as well, the higher the volatility. Look at Uniswap and Chainlink. They have um, higher volatility than, for example, Ether, um, which has been around since 2016. Um, these are all taken from my weekly Great Southgate update. And so this is over the last six months, the returns by the market cap. And in fact, starting at 100 back in October, or 1,000, sorry, back in October, the top 10 ranked Bitcoin, Ether, Polkadot and so forth, have not performed as well as the, the lower ranks. But they had, by January, they were the winners. And then the smaller coins, and what we call tokens. Um, this is really what we call the DeFi and the non-fungible token boom that we're witnessing at the moment, which is causing the outperformance of the smaller coins and tokens. In terms of sector, um, until last week, this new utility gaming media social um, is to do with um, the, the boom in non-fungible tokens um, we'll go into what they are later. So there's just a massive uh, explosion in those, but this wasn't here last week. I just updated the graph uh, on Monday, yesterday. No, day before yesterday. No, yesterday. <laughs> um, so as I said, um, 
a lot of these no, non-fungible tokens like crypto kitties, for example, um, are this year's flavor. Last year, it was decentralized finance. The year before, it was um, all about the onset of what we call initial coin offerings. I'll talk about those in section four, a whole section just about initial coin offerings and how they happen. Um, this is, again, Great South Gates um, analysis, 30 day moving average of um, Bitcoin correlation with um, equities in the US, that's the S&P 500 returns and gold. Um, and you can see it's still very low. Um, at this point last year, and for most of last year, um, there was a lot of manipulation, uh, it still is. I mean, these markets are driven by manipulation. I'll talk about that in the price discovery section at the end. Um, but the manipulation was suppressing the price of, of digital currencies and um, increasing um, the price of um, S&P 500 while also depressing the price of gold, um, although they didn't succeed with silver. Anyway, so then there was this breakout of Bitcoin where it rose last year, it got up to 20,000, 30,000, and now it's, I don't know, we'll have a look on the market soon, but I wouldn't be surprised if it surpassed 60,000 by now per coin. So the, the whole ecosystem is completely different to standard assets. I mean, we're used to dealing with difference between bond mark markets, auction dealer type markets, or um, foreign exchange, and things like exchange traded uh, equities and uh, commodity futures and, and so forth. Um, but the people that have been developing in the crypto asset sphere are not, they don't have traditional um, finance backgrounds. They are um, primarily from um, coding and computer science. And some of the greatest minds are now working in this space, not surprisingly, because the rewards are enormous financially. Um, and there's an awful lot of um, competition. It's a bit like the Wild West out there with all these startups, um, but also incredible innovation. So I'll be talking about some of these main players. I'm not gonna be talking about traditional asset, asset, asset managers, um, like JP Morgan and a few others that are, Fidelity still hasn't, uh, nor has Vanguard moved very much into this sphere. Although Elon Musk tweeted 150 million, which is pin money for him in Bitcoin. Um, I won't be focusing on um, asset managers interests. I won't be focusing very much on what's happening on the regulatory side. Although I do need to mention some of the activities of the um, New York State Attorney, the um, SEC and the CFTC in the States because they are influencing the way the market is evolving. And I won't be talking about central banks, I will just mention what we call CBDCs, central bank digital currencies in passing. And I won't be going into too much detail about the peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms and other shadow banking activities. Instead, I'm going to be focusing on the people who issue the coins, the startups. This is a way of crowdfunding as a startup and an initial coin offering. These are the issuers of new coins and tokens. The difference between a coin and a token is a coin has its own blockchain. So DOT is a coin on the Polkadot blockchain. Um, Bitcoin is a coin on the Bitcoin blockchain. So that's a bit confusing. Um, But that's not exactly standard, nor is the three letter acronym for Bitcoin. Um, BTC is commonly used. Uh, my internet connection is unstable. I will need to have a um, message in chat or, or somebody who, um, I don't know, um, one of the um, people administrating can just um, speak up, unmute yourself and let me know if you miss anything because I just saw that my internet con connection is a little bit weak. I'm afraid my daughter lives with me and she's studying online. So um, that's the, uh, the problem. Um, 
what was I saying? I was talking about the different types of coins and tokens. A token like Tether, for example, lives on other blockchains. Um, so Tether is a story that I'm going to talk about under by far the most influential the stable coins, and it really is driving um, the, the bubbles in the market. Then we have ranking sites, and they're also data providers normally, um, and they um, act as um, uh, they get their revenue by um, issuers getting their coins listed on ranking sites, and then people that look at the ranking sites that are interested in the coin then get linked to the exchanges. And there could be several exchanges that trade a coin, and Bitcoin, it's traded over about um, uh, 160 exchanges at the moment on the spot market, not counting derivatives. It's not like in equity, generally you would have an initial public off offering with, a, with trading on one, possibly two exchanges. Whereas here, it's standard for many exchanges to, to trade different crosses. So some exchanges, for example, Binance, um, would only trade spot Bitcoin against Tether, which is supposed to be one for one with a dollar. That's why it's called a stable coin. Um, others would only trade against the Euro, for example. Um, so we're going to be talking about these four things in the introduction to this um, course. But just briefly, um, and Ernst um, Ernesto did mention CBDCs earlier on. Um, this time last year, when I was teaching my uh, course at the University of Sussex to students, um, all I was reporting was a change of attitude to the previous year where most banks were quite um, negative about the possibility of um, digital money, apart from China. Um, uh, but now this year we have several banks actually operating um, digital currencies. Um, for example, in the Bahamas, there's something called the sand dollar. It's only available to residents, but they are actually trading it digitally. And there's a big push since the sand dollar was, was launched um, about six months ago um, for um, the Chinese, um, the People's Bank of China to issue their own. Um, now they're not like they're not really cryptocurrencies though because they're on a private blockchain. Blockchains um, can be divided into two basic types, private and public. A private blockchain is just a distributed ledger, which is obviously kept digitally. Um, so timestamping is the most important thing. Um, but it can be changed. A a, an entry in the ledger that was entered six months ago could change because it's controlled by the central authority. So the central bank itself could go back and easily change that blockchain because it's not supported by a peer-to-peer -peer network in any way. The idea of public blockchains is that they are um, operational only through the endeavors of um, nodes, special nodes in the network that operate in order to forge or mine new copies of the coin in return for payment of that coin. So for example, the very, very basic Bitcoin blockchain, which was built in 2008, um, well launched um, soon, sorry, launched in um, 2010, I believe, um, was it 2009? Can't remember, the, 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 the Genesis block, the very first block to start the chain had the, had the headlines, um, to, it, was, it was in January 2009 from the Financial Times, Satoshi Nakamoto encoded um, Chancellor on brink of second bailout for banks into um, a 64-bit hexadecimal number. Everything is encoded into hex and you cryptographically hashed. 
Um, let me very quickly, since I, I'm sure I have time and I'm not going to rush, let me very quickly just show you a little bit about how it works. So um, the Bitcoin blockchain uses the SHA-256 twice. Um, that's a cryptographic hash function. That's a password. I don't know whether I want that. Anyway, I can, for example, um, hello, everybody. However long it is, it could be a video. <laughs> Somebody once actually encoded a video of, um, of their child being born onto a block in the Bitcoin blockchain. Hello, everybody. Um, and then I'll generate the hexadecimal number down here. You see, there's 64 of them. So it's 256 because each hexadecimal number is base 16. Um, so it's 256 bits. Um, everything obviously in the computer is stored as binary zero ones, but it's easier for humans to remember these hex numbers. And if you see something beginning with zero X, that means that it is a hexadecimal number because you could have a hexadecimal number like 176. It doesn't have to use the letter A for 10 and B for 11 and so forth up to the letter F for 15. Um, it may be that you can't actually tell the difference between them. And the good thing about these hash functions is you I'd add a full stop here and it completely changes. So you can't reverse engineer. You, knowing the hash, you can't cover it. That's the idea of a good hash function. And then if you put, if you hash it, take, what, take this hash here, copy it, of course, and put it, say, there, and then uh, hash it again. You get, obviously, um, generate, generate the hash of that. You can hash a hash. And if you, you can put them together as well, like this, and this is the process that, oh, I, I overwrote it, but never mind. You can imagine having lots of hashes all together and you generate their hashes. That's called a Merkle tree. So anyway, in the Bitcoin blockchain, um, the miner will um, go to the transactions that are all encoded as hexadecimal numbers with the wallet address, this amount of Bitcoin goes there and so forth. Um, and we'll look at those later um, when uh, we, we look at um, block explorers. Um, and then comes up with one hexadecimal number um, and by hashing them all together and then has to solve this ridiculous consensus algorithm called proof of work. Um, I can talk about that in more detail again if you, you want. The problem with that is it uses a lot of electricity and it's a baby. It was, the Bitcoin blockchain was only ever Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever he is. Um, I think he's probably a chap called Nick Sabo. Um, but uh, it was only ever meant as a sort of um, it's not, it's not great programming or anything like that, it, it, but it started a revolution in the way that the web 3.0 now functions where most of the, uh, well, not yet, but soon, most of the web pages that you go to on the internet will be run by distributed apps um, with instead of um, insecure application process interfacing going between you know your login details and Facebook and going to the Facebook data set and all this is or your bank all this is terribly insecure the whole thing will be securitized by smart contracts which are also coded on the blockchain so this is a, I'm not talking about blockchains so I'm sorry this is about crypto not blockchains let me get back to my um my talk so um anyway so that's basically a difference between a private and a public blockchain is that the public blockchain needs something called a consensus algorithm it, proof of work is very baby um proof of stake or delegated proof of stake or any number of consensus algorithms can be used and the cryptographic hash function SHA-256 can be replaced by what we call succinct non-interactive um, proof of knowledge or, or the zero, zero knowledge snarks. <laughs> it's, it's really very high level. All right, so um, I mentioned decentralized finance as being last year's really booming area. Um, so these DeFi is, is a way of using crypto and other assets for as collateral for peer-to-peer high-yield loans. 
and other sort of shadow banking um, uh, activities. So um, I will look at, um, there's a couple of um, uh, what we call decentralized exchanges. These are like the exchanges I'll be focusing on more, um, particularly next on, Friday, on Thursday, where I look at the derivatives exchanges. And also I'll be looking at the exchanges in um, the rest of this talk, but mainly I'll be focusing on what we call centralized exchanges, which are not actually on the blockchain, but um, Uniswap and SushiSwap and various other what we call swap exchanges are, um, everything is recorded on the blockchain. Um, and then there are others like Compound, um, is a bit similar, it's, it's a way, I mean, if you have coins, you're not trading, you're just what we call hodling, hold on for dear life, you can put them somewhere to get interest. So Compound will give you 6% interest on some coins, but only 1% interest on others. And then this interesting thing called Ample Forth. Um, I mean, all this is terribly new. You have to keep up, every six months things change. And in my role as the um, editor of Journal of Banking and Finance, it's very frustrating to receive papers that were very nice, but um, by the time I see the paper, it's completely out of date. It's very hard to do research in this area because you have to really know what's happening at the front of the wave. Otherwise, by the time you finish, you'll be out of date. Um, anyway, when I talk about stable coins, I will talk about um, ample forth as well. Into the block is a nice source of data. So um, here you can find more data on the distributed finance tokens. Um, if we have time, I will go into all these links. I'm just going to be opening them as we go through um, the real difficulty. I mean, understanding things like what are the gas costs? What's the, what, is it, what does all this mean? When I first started to um, look into this area um, about uh, four years ago myself, it was, there was so much exploding in terms of knowledge, but just understanding what all this meant took, you know, watching videos on YouTube that were probably wrong because, you know, written by some young computer geek who was sort of, uh, anyway, whatever. It took me a very, very long time. Anyway, just to interpret this, this is just looking at the world of DeFi. Um, Uniswap is obviously the biggest one. Um, RAT, Bitcoin, I'll talk about that later, um, um, is another very large part of the market cap. Um, so uh, it's tiny, 50 billion compared. I mean, that's not much more than the entire capitalization of just one stable coin called Tether. Um, so ranking sites are, um, let me just check whether I, I get a non-fungible tokens will come later. The ranking sites, I work with Crypto Compare. I'll talk about more, that, more about that on Thursday. Um, give you data. Oh, ETH has just been downgraded to B+. I mean, they, their credit ratings change enormously. Um, uh, Bitcoin fluctuates between A- and B+. Ether has been A- for a very long time. Um, Ripple used to be up there, but um, there have been some problems with them. A couple of weeks ago, um, uh, Dogecoin was there. <laughs> if I have time, I'll, I'll talk about the funny dodgy coin um engine coin well that's um a new non-fungible token for gaming that's what's created this big boom i talked about earlier engine coin this is dot and this is the chain link coin so these are all new entries not dot but cardano has been around for ages so is litecoin finance coin is a you know, there's been you know the last year or so anyway what do we find from all these things. And this was taken just a week ago, and you can see Dodgy Coin there, but no, no, Chills, Chillis was there. I mean, the rank, apart from Bitcoin and Ether, who, which are always at the top at the moment, um, we can see that um, Bitcoin, the market cap is over a trillion now, um, and 200 billion just for 
ether. So these DeFi tokens are much, much less um, uh, important. Um, and on the coin lists, you can see um, DeFi tokens. So I said engine coin has really risen a lot. Chainlink not doing so well. Uniswap going down. Difficult to know what drives these. It's a, there's so many coins and tokens traded on so many exchanges. It's clear that the, 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 the price discovery mechanism of, um, of derivatives leading spot is certainly the case, but which derivatives? Because there's so many different ones. Derivatives we've never even heard of in um, some uh, spaces like, uh, you know, equities and there's quite a few different types of equity derivatives, but nothing like the ones we we see. You anyway, know, I'm, I'm, I'm putting you here because they have, for teaching purposes, if any of you are interested, they have some very useful reports and guides, for example, an exchange review every month. This is the February one. Um, and a mine of information there. This is my favorite ranking site, but there are many. I mean, for example, you can go to CoinGecko. I don't like this one at all. I'll explain why later. Um, I think the data are really substandard, but the good thing about CoinGecko is that, that you can get more or less any sort of data on CoinGecko. And then there's um, CoinMarketCap. It's another ranking site. There's uh, Crypto Slate. Um, and their data providers, the, the ones that are doing particularly well, actually, like Cointelegraph, are also news sites. Um, and that can be quite frustrating because then the news is very biased towards the coins and markets that they're collaborating with. So you have to be quite careful about the news that you read as well. Anyway, enough of that. Um, now back to, um, so Chainlink is a very interesting one. This allows um, smart contracts, uh, which live on blockchains to communicate with external resources by acting as a bridge between them and data feeds, APIs, traditional bank account payments and so forth. So this is really an integration tool. And that's the one that is really dominating the market cap in the DeFi tokens, although it hasn't been doing so well just recently. But these have been for a while, the Chainlink engine, or engine coin is not really DeFi, I don't know why they've put it there. Um, Chainlink and Uniswap um, have been two of the um, most important DeFi tokens. And there's another engine coin for the, so it's the same engine coin, just a slightly different symbol um, on the non-fungible tokens. And this is for digitizing um, images, music, game cards. I mentioned CryptoKitties before. So with engine coin, you can put all your gaming applications under one coin stamp um, and then sell on um, as those games and the way you play those games become more valuable because you've got more swords or I don't know, I don't know anything about gaming, but you know, your games can become more valuable. So your crypto kitties can be bred and the pedigree of them can become more valuable. Um, and so the, the coin you use to, to seal your game or games itself will, will um, accumulate in value. So this is the new phase, only the last months or so. Um, to actually stay ahead of these, you need to um, get a seat on seeing places like um, the traders I know, they go to, um, for example, Black Dragon. There are many of these analyst sites. Oh, sorry, Black Dragon. Nope, Black Dragon token. Um, this one. So if you're interested in the pre-ICO, because they got so much from the early investors 
um, that they didn't need to go to the public ICO. And um, places like this, it, it, a friend of mine paid 5,000 to get a seat here, which he could now sell for 20,000 because the token itself that he had to buy to get on this site has gone up so much in six months. And what he gets is individual research about all these companies, the data that, you know, anybody can make an initial, initial coin offering, but how much is actually useful? Um, is the white paper just a scam? You know, are the people just gonna walk off with the money and not build what they say they're going to build? So this is a new thing, these sort of behind the scenes, pre-ICO analysis. Um, now, uh, back to, um, uh, the main presentation. Um, and then these stable coins. Stable coins, as you can see from the price, um, not this one, but all the others are just linked to the dollar. Um, just is, um, just is, I'm not quite sure what it's linked to. There's so many of them, you can't keep up with all of them. But anyway, this one has a tiny market cap compared with, um, this was um, the market cap about a week ago of Tether, 36.82 billion. That's 10 times what it was nine months ago. Oh no, sorry, a year and nine months ago. Um, I'll, I'll explain why June 2019 is an important date um, in a minute. Um, so there is a big problem with this tether. The others are much smaller and for example, Binance coin has a proper use. So does USD coin, DAI, that's um, a way of funding projects in building dams in Africa and things like that. So a lot of them are, are really above board, but um, with tether. Um, so here is a, a network diagram of the um, the omni layer of the Bitcoin blockchain. What is the omni layer of the Bitcoin blockchain? Well, as I said, the Bitcoin blockchain is a very elementary type of blockchain with this untenable, unusable consensus algorithm called Sas Satoshi um, or Nakamoto uh, consensus or proof of work, which uses a lot of electricity. Um, it wasn't designed for smart contracts. However, one of the second layer protocols on the Bitcoin blockchain is called the Omni layer. And this does allow smart contracts to be coded on the Bitcoin blockchain. And by analyzing those smart contracts, uh, Griffin and Shams, um, these are a pair of academic researchers in the University of Texas, and this paper was her second, their second paper in the Journal of Finance about market manipulation. The first being um, the previous year about the manipulation of VIX, um, the settlement price of the VIX using S&P 500 options. Anyway, so the nodes in the network um, correspond to the amount of tether and the edges go this way. So there's the, um, the tether issuer, the tether company, um, and then it goes to an unknown wallet. Then it goes to the Bitfinex exchange. And we don't know what happens to it there because within the exchange, it's not on the blockchain. Then it goes via another unknown wallet to Poloniex exchange, also to Bittrex. And the whole system is coming from tether. Um, and the same people that um, were the um, chief executive, chief operating officer, chief investment officer, and the whole board of the Bitfinex exchange were the same people as the Tether company. Um, not only that, in order to print a stable coin, make a new one, you're supposed to have a dollar. So the Tether company now should have over $36 billion collateralization. It doesn't have to be actual dollars. It could be other currencies or other assets. 
The tr problem was um, back in 2019 that um, the collateralization of Tether could not be verified by auditors. In fact, the company sacked auditor after auditor and eventually came up with some um, having moved the domicile of the company around from Malta to the Bahamas and changing banks every month, Delta Bank, um, uh, some unintelligible signature said, yes, they have um, $3 billion, because that's what it was at that time. Now it's nearly $40 billion. I mean, when you think about the funding of the Fed, you know, $7 trillion in total is the sort of debt. But um, the, 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 the way that the US Treasury prints dollars effectively by operating in the long term um, bond market in particular, um, it's, it is on a par with that. But these are digital dollars not being printed by the Federal Reserve or the Treasury, sorry, um, but um, by some four or five guys in the Bahamas. So there's been an ongoing investigation for a very, very, very long time. And this um, from February the 23rd, so it's only a few weeks ago, after two years, the New York State Attorney had been going after um, Tether to try to show what had happened to a particularly a missing 850 million. Uh, in the end, there's this tiny, tiny fine. I mean, we were absolutely astonished. And since then, Bitcoin's just taken off even more. These guys think they can do anything. I um, wrote an article about this back in um, June 2019, which was picked up first by the FT and then all over the media in the US in particular. Um, this is from a paper that I'll talk about um, later this morning um, about the supply of tether and the Bitfinex, um, the, the spread between Bitfinex and other exchanges, because the tether was, this was before we knew the Griffins and Shams results, but we could just pick it up by looking at centralized exchanges and what was happening. And you can see at this time on the right hand side, you know, it was about 3 billion um, in, in June or July, 2019. And the price of Bitcoin was about 10,000. And this we thought was the second tether bubble, bubble. That's what we called the blog that we wrote. Um, but now we're in the third one, it's even more frightening. All right, so in terms of my time, um, I have um, another half an hour um, before, I, or more than that, before I need to start wrapping up and taking some more questions. So that took a long time just to give you an idea of this area because it's, I've only still just touched the surface but now we can go a little bit um, faster. And I'm going to focus first of all on the exchanges because that is the easiest source of data for analysis. Um, of course, you can go into the actual blockchain and many people do, but nowadays it's done for you. For example, into the block uh, that analyzes the the structure of every block and um, gives data that if you subscribe, there's a seven day free trial as well. You can look at all the um, activity on the blockchain. Anyway, so just over the last months, you can see um, that on the decentralized exchanges, the volume peaked um, here February 23rd at 4 billion, but generally speaking, it's around about 2 billion with most of it on Uniswap and Susie Schwab. Um, so we'll look at those in a minute. Um, here, this is the Crypto Compare Exchange report, looking at the balance between spot and derivatives from um, a year ago, um, it was mainly spot, but now in fact, it's just about a little bit, 51% is on of the trading volume is on derivatives exchanges. Um, and that's in counting the notional on the derivatives and the leverage is absolutely massive as we shall see. Um, and looking at the particular exchanges, Binance has grown rapidly um, and OKEx, BitMEX, Huobi are also very big 
derivatives exchanges. So we'll look at those this afternoon when we um, analyze some price discovery. Just to show you the range of these centralized exchanges, I've just copied from the exchange report the top tier spot exchanges, Coinbase, Gemini, Bitstamp, Kraken, Itbit, and Luno all currently have a double A rating. Um, whereas going down to the D&E ratings, we've got exchanges, as I said before, about 163 are currently ranked and there are more that aren't even ranked. Um, and these exchanges engage in very um, uh, dubious practices, which are designed to try to boost the amount of volume artificially by using a manipulation mechanism called wash trading. So a trader will set up uh, an account and buy, sell, buy, sell, actually buy, sell against themselves, either side of the ticker price. Um, and they can do this because these exchanges have negative fees for market makers. So as long as they're making the market and not taking the market, um, they can wash trade and gain the exchange's coin. So this is one of the reasons how Binance became, and Binance on a spot exchanges is, is actually A, but in terms of the derivative exchanges, it's now the predominant exchange and it built its volume with Binance coin. That's how traders were rewarded. If they, if they made the market, they earned Binance coin. And on the decentralized exchanges, the most obvious one is Uniswap. Um, now looking at the liquidity on Unis Uniswap, it started about six months ago um, and very rapidly went up to at the moment um, um, nearly 5 billion of liquidity with trading volume um, mirroring that liquidity. So what is this? It's a way of, of trading um, ERC20 tokens. Uh, so it uses the, what we call Ethereum request for comment, ERC, um, ERC20 as a standard um, ICO type format, where the protocols um, uh, are of a type where it's easy to construct smart contracts where you can exchange one token for another. Incidentally, Ether, which was the original um, cryptocurrency for the Ethereum blockchain um, was in the ICO and then the development um, committee and uh, the network operated together to, to agree the ERC-20 standards, but Ether doesn't adhere to them. So you have to wrap it in an ERC-20 um, shell in order to trade Ether on any of these things. And the same thing with Bitcoin, it needs to be wrapped. The others, Tether is an ERC-20 token, DAI and so forth. So you can see that the amount of liquidity, if I put my Ether onto Uniswap, then um, that would be adding to this liquidity there. And I can either earn interest or if I want, at once on the exchange, I could swap it for for wrapped Bitcoin, that's one way of trading Ether for Bitcoin on a DEX. Um, but other people would trade Ether and Bitcoin maybe on a centralized exchange, particularly if the fees are, are small. So um, this whole Uniswap um, uh, approach to trading is completely different. And the way the market making happens with the automatic market making is also completely different to the centralized exchanges. It's something, I mean, I'm doing a lot of research, so much to research on, on this area, but I haven't had the bandwidth to get on to looking at the automated market making on, on um, Uniswap yet. So um, I won't be able to answer any questions on that. So the block explorer will tell you what's happening on the blockchain. So. For example, we could look at Etherscan. Here's Etherscan. This is the current block on Etherscan. Let's just make that bigger. So we're um, 17 seconds ago. Um, this block was 
built and the they call it minor but they are it's a, now s20 is using proof of stake and proof of work so it's validator or forger is a different word we use um, this gives you the ether price if we look at the block we'll also see what the gas price is so you see this tiny little petrol pump here and 128 gray here that's the the price of gas um, Gwei is, um, there are uh, 10 to the 9 Gweis in one ether. Um, and you can see the price of, of gas um, changing if we look at a little bit more detail at the Ethereum blockchain. This will take a while to fire up, so I'll go back there. So in this particular block, there were 129 transactions. Um, there were 36 smart contract transactions, which could be a smart contract that's transferring a token over the Ethereum blockchain, or it could be um, a, because some banks use Ethereum for uh, um, fixed income payments. So it could be a payment on an interest rate swap or something like that. Um, this is the wallet address, OX is a hexadecimal number, so this is the wallet address of Sparkpool, which is one of the, there's only about eight or, or so in the Ethereum network. Uh, you know, depending on the network, the miners go into pools because um, they uh, get, they, they, there's less competition that way and more revenue to them. Um, if we look at the Ethereum um, dashboard here, you can see the live nodes. Um, and the average block time is um, 13 seconds as opposed to Bitcoin. The average block time is about 10 minutes. Um, and every time a block is built, the currency is issued. At the moment, there's 6.25 um, uh, Bitcoin per block, so every 10 minutes. Um, and every, and there, the number of ether per block, I think, it depends whether it's what we call an uncle block or a natural block. It varies between two and five ether. Um, but the reward for blocks, so every time it updates, you see there's a new block being built on this screen. The reward, um, the halves, um, so the Bitcoin one is designed to halve every four years or so. Um, the ether one um, has a different schedule for halving but there comes a time when no more this is why it's not a fiat currency um, there's a limited supply unless of course they change the protocol there is a limited supply um, anyway so as you can see the gas spending and the gas limit goes goes on it it depends how many people want smart contracts because the gas is only used for the smart contracts in the block so these 38 contract internal transactions would be computer code that had um, conditional statements, do loops, addition, multiplication, and all that sort of thing. And each one of those um, uh, actions um, carries a gas price. So it might be two guay for an addition or three guay for um, a, uh, a loop or something like that. Anyway, again, I'm going back to blockchains. I should do a separate one just on blockchains. It's very difficult if you're not understanding blockchain to really understand what's happening in crypto. Um, so let's go back here. Still on the chain, we can um, uh, look at some of the larger flows, mainly between these centralized exchanges like Binance um, or Huobi, um, using something called Whale Alert. This is quite a useful um, tool for looking at um, future movements. So this is the current whale well alert, and you can also look at recordings of various activities. Um, if I go to the Great Southgate um, report, I might do that uh, later on this afternoon. So again, it's mainly by Binance is, is really getting most of the, of the um, traffic at the moment. So the, these are just large transactions, okay? Not, not all the transactions, but it gives you an idea of how the network's operating. We'll get some more views of the network visually later on. 
Um, this is another way of transferring funds, which I'm very concerned about. Um, it's called the Lightning Network. Um, and this is another second layer protocol built on the Bitcoin blockchain. Because the problem with Bitcoin is that if it takes 10 minutes to build a block um, and your transaction may not be taken in that block, you could be waiting an hour for your transaction to be validated and confirmed. And if you're waiting for a cup of coffee, you may not want to wait half an hour. So you can't use Bitcoin for ordinary transactions unless you open up something called a lightning channel with your coffee shop. So you just put Bitcoin on that lightning channel and then it's just like tapping um, your card every time you go there. That was the original sales thing of the lightning network, but it's being used for, as always, very nefarious pro processes now. Um, so at the moment, the dollar value locked in these 9,000 channels exceeds 52 million. That's five times more than a year ago. And given it's a very, very, you can see the rise here, um, it's a very recent innovation. Um, I was very interested from the start. As soon as I heard about it, I went on it and found this um, uh, map of the channels. And... Um, what particularly interested me was the BitMEX channel, because I was looking at these channels down here and then I found this one called BitMEX Research. Now the BitMEX exchange is another, it's like the Bitfinex problem with Tether, but for different reasons. So this is called BitMEX Research, this particular set of light lightning channels. So this collection of nodes. So for example, if we go, I don't know, down to here, this one has, um, goes to this one, Bcash is trash, Monemi, Digital Wampum, and BitMEX Research. So that's one of the BitMEX Research connections, but the BitMEX Research has um, nearly 600 channels. And until May last year, it was located in London. I was very intrigued about this and I wrote a blog about it and um, saying that I thought that um, it was quite clear that because it was going to these exchanges um, and OKEX is now, OKEX is one of the biggest derivatives exchange now has publicized it has a proper lightning channel going to it. It means that US investors could have gone through London where they kept the crypto because you were, their banks were allowed to store crypto in London at that point, still are. Um, and then bankers could trade um, on the markets uh, that are banned from the US. But then the custodian of crypto was allowed by US banks in May and immediately the BitMEX research channel located to the US. Um, I'm not the only one that sort of sees a bit of a conspiracy here. Um, in fact, let me just go back to um, my presentation. Um, the uh, uh, CFTC went after them. Dan Berkowitz, before he left the CFTC. The CFTC are now um, gearing up to really learning as much as they possibly can about what's happening here. And I'll be talking to them um, in some seminars uh, later. Um, but they were already aware about what was happening in BitMEX research. That's the node, that's what it looks like. This is what's happening on BitMEX. And the problem with BitMEX that the CFTC found was that the um, vetting of um, customers was not like it was in Coinbase. I remember when I first got interested in it, some friends of mine wanted to trade on Coinbase, but there was a a, a traffic jam with everybody trying to trying to register and having to give bank account details or their passport details and so Coinbase which is located in the US used to be called GDAX um, has a very good it's a semi-regulated exchange whereas BitMEX not at all but um, so this know your customer debacle 
came from the New York State Attorney. And there was a long video that they had about it as well. But then in January, they say, yes, we know everything about our customers. Her name's Mary, she's 27, her blood type is A minus and her hair is brown and this sort of thing. But let's just see what's happening on BitMEX, huh? So here we are, a BitMEX. And this is the Bitcoin, what we call perpetual. It's quite inactive at the moment. That's uh, because Bitcoin volatility is, is relatively low. But um, let me see if I can see. I know Ripple has a lot of manipulation. Let's see what's happening there. No, nothing much, much quieter. Um, dodgy coin, that's always very dodgy. No, it's actually, it's very, very quiet. Maybe we should look again this afternoon because of course the US hasn't woken up. <laughs> it's too early. As soon as they wake up, you'll see what happens on BitMEX. So at the moment, what's Bitcoin trading at there? Five, 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 five. five. Okay. Now, uh, in terms of time, we are 11.27, so I'm an hour through, that's fine. I'm going to probably be able to cover this section before I take questions. In fact, I think I can turn my um, well, I will, yes, I'll turn my timer off, otherwise it's a bit annoying. So I'm going to be talking about one of the earliest publications. Um, didn't actually get into print until 2020, but it was out there in 2018 and then developed. And um, because I started with my fourth year now PhD student, the, he and I sort of went into blockchain together because um, I'd started looking at it and uh, it was very nice to have somebody who was interested to talk about it with. Um, and when he became my PhD, he joined me in this research. And we first of all looked at um, the sources of data. Um, and in his literature review, he found that there was a huge discrepancy in the type of data available. So you can download data from all sorts of places. I've shown you CoinGecko, Crypto Compare. Coin market cap is another one, or crypto data download is another one. Um, so you can download data. If you go to, let me just show you crypto data downloads actually. Uh, crypto data download, I like a lot because it gives you data and it's free, of course, a lot of it is free. Gives you data on, um, many different exchanges. So you know that these are traded prices. Oh dear, oh there we are, good. Right, so you just go down to, uh, where is it? it keeps changing. Um, historical data, okay. So if we just go to these exchanges or EU and Russian exchanges. So these are some of the exchanges that supports it. Let me look at Luno because that's just been rising up the rankings. Uh, they've only got, Bitcoin against some um, unusual, um, uh, these are new coins um, and daily and hourly, probably not very much. Um, I just went on the daily one then, but I doubt if it goes back very far because Luno has, um, Okay, oh, it's got Unix timestamps. That's boring. Oh no, here we are, that's fine. So August 27th last year, not very much. But it gives, it's like Yahoo Finance, gives you open, high, low, close, volume and so forth. Okay, let me look at another exchange. Maybe, uh, if, uh, let me have a look at some of the EU exchanges. Exmo has been going for ages and hit BTC. But again, they're probably just specialized. Oh no, hit BTC has quite a lot of pairs against dollar. Um, these are all spot prices, no derivatives. And again, hourly data. Um, so let me have a look at say the ether pair um, on the hourly, how far that goes back. It won't go as far back as the daily data. But the point is that these are traded prices and it gives you the ability to make um, some pretty useful high frequency analysis. And this actually, the hourly prices go all the way back to um, June 2018. So it's a really huge spreadsheet here. So these are fine. They're from an exchange. Okay. 
However, when you go to um, something like um, Crypto Compare, we'll go back there. What is this price here for Bitcoin? Well, it's an index price. It's one price created over many different spot exchanges. So I'll talk about how this, this coin index price, which is not a traded price, is constructed. It's a volume weighted average price. Okay. And then we do look at three centralized exchanges here. We look at the, at the time Kraken, Poloniex and Bitfinex were the main spot exchanges. That's changed now, but at the time, that's what we looked at. And then there are these <coughs> crypto market wide indices, which are constructed in different ways. So this is akin to the S&P 500, where different numbers of coins are taken. <coughs> the CCI 30, which I like best, is based on 30 coins. The Crix, which I like least, is based on a varying number, maybe about 50 or so. And MVDA, the MVIS index, is also pretty good, but it's cap weighted, which is not so good. Um, 25 coins, the top cap coins. Um, I'll go through their methodologies in a minute. And in, the, in this paper, the results we present are um, based on, first of all, looking at simple statistics. And then um, what I'm going to present here is the capital asset pricing model estimations, assuming zero risk-free rate, where this RT would be the daily return on the ice source of the coin price. So it could be a centralized exchange or it could be one of these price indices. And the RT, the market wide, is one of these three blue. So there's lots of different CAPM um, estimations and lots of different coins. I, I'm just going to show you Bitcoin and Ether. And we do this at the daily level, just for illustration. And we also look at um, volatility estimations for these different data sources using various statistical models. And I'm just going to show you the Markov switching asymmetric student T-Garch, which is the most complex one, but actually the most necessary one to get robust uh, results. So on these uh, crypto price indices, um, for CoinGecko, CoinMarketCap, and CryptoCompare, that's CG, CM, and CC, they use different N um, and different actual sources. So the source um, would be um, a, an exchange like Kraken or um, HitBTC or any number of, um, it could be up to 500, um, Coin, crypto, um, coin, coin market cap uses around 400 actually, 300 for CoinGecko, but much fewer for crypto compare. The thing about these two, they use 300 sources because they also infer from cross rates, which they should really not be doing. It's one of the reasons why I don't like um, the CoinGecko and coin market cap as much as crypto compare because they might get a, an ether euro um, price from Ether USD and USD Euro, but that's not a good way to infer the actual price because it assumes that all trades are also traded on both crosses, which isn't the case. So PI, that's the price of coin I at time T, is, you, is a volume weighted average of the price of coin I at time T on exchange J or from source J. And the volume as well, this is the problem with the crosses. How do you infer a volume from a cross? As I said, you have to assume that everything is traded on both in order to get a volume. So you look at the volume as well and it's a volume weighted average for the price. Uh, in, in, just to comment on that, in the days where there was more exchange arbitrage, um, a couple of years ago when these were developed, it was possible to, to do some arbitrage on exchanges, but of course the algos and the, bot, the, 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 the robots have traded away any, um, any exchange arbitrage by now. Um, 
And then the market-wide indices are cap-weighted indices derived from um, 25 to 50 large cap coins. There's a, it's a bit like the um, Dow Jones in that the divisor is changed periodically, but not like the Dow Jones because there is a volume here as well, the, or the circulating supply rather than the traded volume, which is almost the number of coins an issue apart from fact with Bitcoin, a lot of them have disappeared and they're not circulating and haven't been for many years. Um, so it's the circulating supply, a bit like the number of shares issues basically. So it's a sort of cap weighted thing. But the problem is that it's very dominated by the circulating supply of Bitcoin and the price of Bitcoin. Uh, and the reason why I like the CCI 30 index, which you can find more um, information about here, is that it uses um, a, it gives you the constituents there. Um, so there's 30 of them and they don't, they're not the same over time and they, um, the divisor changes over time. Um, and the methodology is based on the um, market cap. So P times Q, that's the M here. And so they, they sum the square root of P times Q and the divisor is a simple one. So it's uh, just the sum of them. So instead of having square root here, um, there's an adjustment, which I think is much fairer because it doesn't give the predominance to Bitcoin that the others are just very, very highly correlated with. So this is just a shot from the paper where looking at the non-traded prices, we get slightly different statistics for um, volatilities um, and compared with the traded prices, you might think that they should be slightly lower. That's not the case. The bit for next volatility is lower than all of those. And um, we only looked at data from 2016 to March 2019. That's when we finished the paper. Um, but then it just shows that there are these regimes where, you know, you've got 105 volatility here and then going back. So this was a very volatile regime at this point. So we separated it out. Um, the positive skew, so the volatility was on the upside and um, the uh, ketosis is... Uh, is, is because of high volatility, the ketosis is lower. But a lot of upside volatility that you don't get in other markets. Maybe in some commodities you would, you know, for example, increase in oil price would induce um, an increase in volatility um, as for, because of the consumers, um, whereas a decrease would um, induce an increase in volatility because of the producers, but uh, usually the consumers win on commodities. So looking at the capital asset pricing model estimations here. So we've got Bitcoin above and Ether here. And we see the same features for both. Um, so here, the, uh, this is just the beta. Okay, I forget about the alpha and anything else. You can see with the CCI 30, the, the, the Bitcoin beta seems to be around 0.73 or 0.74 in all of them relative to the CCI 30, apart from CoinGecko data. So there's something odd about that. And when we look at the CRICS, it's out of line with the CCI 30, but more in line with the, um, with the coin market cap. Not surprisingly, because they're not using the square root of cap. Uh, but although it's a different number of coins, so they're not the same indices by any means. Crix has many more coins. We would expect them to be similar, and they are, except for CoinGecko, where this Bitcoin beta is really, really high here, but more similar to the CC. This is rather odd. And we see similar features with Ether in that the CoinGecko data is, is a bit weird. Um, so let's have a look at what happened. So when we went into more details, here you can see the spread between the one we prefer, which is Crypto Compare and CoinGecko. That's the blue 
numbers here and coin market cap and coin and crypto compare. That's the red one. Now, these are price indices for Bitcoin and on the right price indices for Ether. And they're not exactly the same. So we wouldn't expect, expect it to be exactly zero, but they should be pretty similar. And indeed, for the coin market cap one, we find that they are pretty similar here and, and here. Um, but something happened here on, actually it was the 30th of January, where suddenly there's massive differences between the coin gecko data for Bitcoin and Ether and Litecoin and all the data that they quote. Um, and then we lagged it and we found that the problem was that there was some repeat of data. So you have to, if you're using that data, you have to delete 30th of January to get it to be correct. Now we did write to them and we also wrote to the Cricks people from University of Berlin um, before we published anything and we pointed this out, but um, we didn't get any reply. So we just went ahead and published. But you can see that the Crix index is also infected by the CoinGecko problems because the Crix were using CoinGecko data. So be very careful if you're going to do any analysis. My advice is to use CCI30. And if you're not using actual traded data, then use the crypto compare price indices. Now, finally, I'm going to look at some Garch models and then uh, we can stop for some questions. Um, so uh, I'm not going to go through what Garch is. I'm sure that particularly those of you who are working in market risk, um, you'd be perfectly au fait with what a Garch model is. Um, so the crypto asset returns are very hard. It took Michael months to get the right coding that would generate robust results. I'm not going to present all of those. You can go to the paper that I referred to if you want to see them in more detail. But one of the things that's important are two sources of asymmetry. We've got the usual um, volatility response. The asymmetry in that is sometimes termed the leverage effect. So um, you can either use an exponential GARCH or just an asymmetric GARCH or what we call the GJR, the um, Gloston Jenkel Rankin model. This is from back in the last century. These were developed. This is the GJR one. Um, and so what it means is that instead of the usual term, which wouldn't have this indicator function, which adds an extra gamma if the return is negative. Um, the, so you have got a, a conditional mean model, maybe something like um, the most you would have for a conditional mean model would be this, okay, but, or you wouldn't even have this term, but the epsilon are like the zero mean returns at least, or at least innovations in returns beyond what you might predict in a Gartz model, you're not gonna put much in the conditional mean equation. Uh, otherwise you have too many parameters. You just take the residuals anyway from whatever you've got. And that's what these things are. So they're the unexpected returns or innovations. And in an equity market, you would expect that if there's a negative um, one, that volatility would increase. Um, this is something called the leverage effect. It means that say, for example, Ford um, um, General Motors have a big 20% negative return and suddenly their price earnings, um, their, sorry, debt to equity ratio changes a lot. They, um, they've got much more debt as a proportion of the equity because the equity has just gone down by 20%, um, which makes, this is one of the main analysts' um, uh, signals, um, more sell uh, recommendations would, would, would be um, ensuing. And so one price fall will lead to other price falls, but then people think of, you know, the value investors will, will come in. And so what happens is that you often find that there's a lot of volatility following a price fall. But if you get a 20% price rise, you'll get very little volatility in equities. It can be the other way in commodities. FX, it's not so clear. It may not even be so much asymmetry in the volatility response. But it's clear that in something like um, 
uh, crypto, which can operate like an equity because of these initial coin offerings. They're like equity and company, many of them. It can operate like a commodity because many coins are like utilities, you know, solar power engineering or something like that. There are about 5,000 of these by now and they go into different sectors. Um, so it may be that um, we only need this sort of leverage effect, this negative leverage effect. Um, and then the other source of asymmetry is in the innovations themselves, which clearly are not normal. And in, so we use a skewed student T for the more sort of endemic or chronic asymmetry that you would find. Skew is a funny thing. It comes from two sources. It comes from a sort of chronic asymmetry, but it also comes from a, a sort of um, acute large jumps that can also, you need many parameters to model a skew. Um, so otherwise it's a normal sort of Garch model and we can get the unconditional steady state volatility. Um, and we do different regimes. So the I is a regime and having tested regimes, we use two regimes, which we can identify using this unconditional steady state volatility as a low volatility regime and a high volatility regime. That's how it turns out. Um, and then there are the state transition probabilities. Pij is the probability that you're in state j at time t, given that you were in state i at time t minus one. So p11 is the probability you stay in state one or the low vol state. P22 is the probability you stay in the high vol set state. And the probability of transitioning from the low vol to the high vol is p12 and going back, it's P21. So this is the standard Markov switching um, Garch framework. And um, Michael used an R package um, that, he, um, that he found on the internet, but he had to adjust it because um, he was using MCMC as well. The other thing about estimating Garch models is that if you try a standard maximum likelihood estimator, it's very likely to fall over when you have a lot of parameters like we have here. So Markov chain Monte Carlo for me has always been, whenever you're using individual Garch has always been the, the method of choice. Um, and uh, so the sample period uh, is pretty long. It's from September, 2013 to the 31st of March. And I'm only going to present results for, for Bitcoin here because um, we don't have data on Ether until 2016 and not really enough to, to estimate such a complex model. But if we look at the results for the, um, for example, the unconditional volatility that we derive using parameter estimates in the places for omega, alpha, gamma, and beta um, are quite different depending on whether we use Coin market cap, coin gecko, crypto compare, bit stamp or crack. And so data really matters. Look at the difference between bit stamp and crack in here. One thing that you can tell is that there is a significant and negative leverage effect. In other words, volatility increases more following a price fall than it does following a price rise of the same magnitude. And the betas are similar to the sort of betas we might find in equity markets. Um, and these are the parameters of the skewed student, student T. Um, and in the high volatility state, I've just highlighted a few rather unusual results here. So again, the unconditional um, uh, volatility here is um, higher, that's why we call it the high volatility state, but also very different depending on which data source you use. Um, and some very strange estimates for the constants. Um, we all, with Markov chain Monte Carlo, you get confidence intervals for these medians. These are actually the median of the Markov chain simulation. Um, and uh, these are way out, way out of confidence intervals that you have for the other parameter estimates. Um, that's why I've highlighted them. And in particular, what we notice is that there is fairly robust, apart from coin market cap, negative. I mean, sorry, th that one's negative, but the leverage effect is positive. In other words, price rises are the ones that people become nervous of. And this is characteristic of a bubble. And we're seeing this at the moment that 
when the, when the Bitcoin price jumps down, the Bitcoin implied volatility index, which I'll be talking about on Thursday, goes down. <laughs> but it's the opposite when it goes up because people are very nervous about the market at the moment. Um, and the other um, odd things here are the transition probabilities, which you know one would expect them to not to be as low as 0.7 or even 0.6, because otherwise uh, you're transitioning between the states far too rapidly. Um, so um, here they're fairly stable, so you stay in a state for a fair amount of time, whereas here those transition probabilities. So this whole Garch model is just really wrong, and this one as well, um, just not right. But the crypto compare data are fairly solid also for these complex Garch models. So um, I'm going to stop sharing. And uh, we're now just at the time where Lewis is going to be thinking about uh -huh. questions. Okay, Carol, thank you very much for your nice talk. So it is time for questions. I think that there are no questions so far.